Good evening, all of you. I'm, of course, very pleased to be here and a little nervous to talk about a book which isn't entirely finished yet and which is still a rather new and exciting topic for me. Rightists and jihadists' reactions to women's emancipation. And, uh, but before I go into that, I want to locate it a little bit in the ongoing discussion about the work of Norbert Elias, because it relates to certain aspects of his work. Uh, frankly, thinking about this conference, it occurred to me that there may be four frontiers in the work on Norbert Elias' theory of civilizing processes. One is, did the civilizing process change direction? That was an old question which was asked early in the Amsterdam School of Social Science Research. People like Kas Wouters, uh, um, Christine Brinkheve and Michael Kurtzek, Paul Kaptein and I worked on that. And in a way, that was, it was not too difficult to accommodate Norbert's theory of the civilizing process to developments in the first half of the 20th century. And he himself already had done quite a few, uh, quite a bit of work on that theme in his last chapter in the Uberden Prozess. The other, much more uh, precarious uh, frontier, concerns civilizing processes in stateless societies and in recent states. Uh, there was a, a brief session this afternoon about some of work, uh, preliminary work by Norbert Elias, unpublished, unpublished on the, the, the sociology of African societies, where he was putting his big toe in the water, water of theory rather than really swim. Uh, and it remains an extremely problematical encounter between, say, African sociologists and us theorists of civilization. I witnessed, what I gave a, a lecture on Norbert Elias in, in Senegal recently in Dakar, and you must realize that those countries for a hundred years had been conquered and colonized under the banner of civilization, or rather civilization, la mission civilisatrice. And in Senegal, talking about civilisation noire is a revolutionary act. And even to this day, it is a way of taking back some of the terrain, intellectual terrain, which the Western thinkers had taken over. And frankly, I don't think we have made much headway in this respect. I thought maybe African sociologists should study process of state formation, court society, and development of formalization of manners. Because frankly, I don't think we're getting very far. It's also a little worrisome that still we have not succeeded in tempting African sociologists, sociologists of color to join our ranks and give a very necessary, somewhat different perspective on what we're doing. And frankly, since it's a different perspective, I can't tell in advance what it will be. But if it's, right now it's failing. So that is a problematic frontier of th civilization theory. <clears throat> then there is another field which I'm much more optimistic about it, and that's the study of non-European uh, long-term state formation processes such as in Japan, in China, in India, and some studies I understand are underway there. And I feel that that may, is a very fruitful uh, terrain. One cannot possibly blame Norbert Elias for being Eurocentric. What do you expect? That all in his own, he would do the entire world. No, and he expressly always was aware that there were other parallel histories of state formation. And then there is a problematic field about decivilization or discivilization processes, the breakdown of civilization. And Norbert Elias 
confronted that question head on in his studies about the Germans. And there his take on it is that there was a collapse of civilization. That's what he means by a de-civilizing process. And I have worked on, on, on genocides in the 20th century and also on Nazi Germany. And I felt that that was somehow unsatisfying. That after all, and that is maybe the most creepy thing about Nazi society, society went on as usual in many, many respects. That's the scary thing. But there were enclaves of barbarism. More specifically, these were enclaves, archipelagos of enclaves of barbarity, where total brutalization was not only condoned, but encouraged and instrumentalized by the state. It was, to paraphrase a, a uh, statement by Sigmund Freud, regression in the service of the states. Uh, and the barbarism, the total abandon in perversity and cruelty that occurred there on the part of guards and torturers served a function for the state. Very similar things happened in, in, uh, in Bosnia under Serbian and even Croatian direction. So I should say uh, these, these uh <coughs> it is not just collapse and disintegration, it is a continuation of a more rigid and formal formalized form of civilization, more stratified, more repressive, both internally and externally, and on the other hand, total brutality within well-shielded enclaves where barbarization was condoned and encouraged. So these I consider the four most germane frontiers for working on civilizing theory. Uh, changes in the direction of the Western civilizing process, civilizing processes in stateless societies and recent states, uh, civilizing processes of long-term state formation in non-Western societies, and de-civilizing and dis-civilizing processes. And finally, there's another little uh, conundrum in the theory. O when asked the question, Norbert Elias always maintained that his term civilization was non-judgmental, that it was a neutral, detached uh, term. But hardly surprisingly, <laughs> when he does his studies on the Germans, there is obviously the author feels that that was a horrible uh, event and a terrible history, that decivilization is something terrible. And there is even the hope for a more civilized, more global society in which people will li live more peacefully. Well, I forgive him. I mean, nobody can confront Nazism without having these thoughts. But there are two, uh, two ways of going about it. It is not entirely clear. I don't think it matters very much, but you must aware, be aware of it that you have a term such like democracy. Almost everybody who talks about democracy is in favor of it. Women's emancipation, by the way. Most people who talk about it and do studies about it are in favor of it. But it's a neutral term. So this is a common problem in the social sciences. Our, we have our sympathies, and sometimes we act more detached than we are in fact. So this is a little preliminary uh, introduction, or oh, introductions are preliminary, uh, to see where the, 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 the civilizing process theory demands more elaboration, more expansion. Now, I choose the topic of uh, extreme right-wing opposition to women's emancipation. And I studied jihadists, these are extreme fundamentalist Islamists, very militant, religious fundamentalists in other religions, and secular right-wing extremists. A major element of these rather disparate, mov disparate movements is their resistance to women's emancipation. And much more than they are willing to admit in first instance. One striking thing is that 
uh, usually these, let me call them reactionary authoritarian movements, don't bother too much about women because they have more, much more important things to talk about. But when you scratch it a little, you find that the caliphate, which is the great ideal of the jihad, or um, the nation or the folk, which is the great ideal uh, of extreme right-wing movements, uh, all, if you scratch it a little bit, it is all about women. Because the, the, the jihadists don't even have to talk about All they have to say is Sharia, which will reign supreme in the, uh, in the caliphate. And if you read their version of Sharia, which is a very modern, very standardized, very literal reading, as if the, the Sharia tradition was the, the Code Napoleon, and that is where Kut got it. They wanted a, a Muslim code which was as clear as the French code which at the time reigned in Egypt. Uh, so it's a very modern reading of Sharia, but women come out rather uh, poorly. They, their rights are severely restricted in this reading of this huge collection of uh, let me say, sage and wise thoughts that is, has been brought together through the centuries. And the same applies to folk. If you look a little bit at what they... First, if you ask what folk or nation means, it already implies that you don't belong. Because if you belonged, you would know what it was and you wouldn't ask. But if you have to ask, it is all about family values, it's all about a pure, brotherly, strong community of people who really love and trust each other, and it is built up, the bricks of this uh, fortress are the families, and in the families, men must defend their kin, their wife and children, therefore there must be danger, and you must identify the danger, the threat to the family, and so since there is a danger and a threat to the family, men must defend them. Women therefore depend on men because women are uh, somewhat weak. They are not entirely in possession of their own impulses. They cannot really fight for themselves. Therefore, they must support and preferably obey their men and make beautiful white babies. This is a literal quotation they must make sure that the, the, that the folk reproduces itself, is not overwhelmed by other foreign uh, people, and therefore their task is to care for children, but make white children. I have only been looking at extreme right-wing white movements. All right. So these are the people I'm talking about, very disparate people and very disparate movements and groups and group schools. But in order to make my case, I start out with an entire part of the book, which is about the general human pattern, which was a term of a Marxist historian in the Netherlands, a couple, Jan and Annie Romain, at Algemeen Menselijk Patroon, completely out of date, outmoded, but I thought it was a good idea to say certain things belong to a general human pattern. And the subjection of women, I'm afraid so, is part of a very general human pattern. It would be a pity not to use that generalization. Of course, it was in different ways and to different degrees, and many women could escape it to a certain measure. But women have been subjected to men throughout the ages, all over the globe. There are exceptions, but the mainstream is very clear. However, when the talk is, is about patriarchy, male domination, the interpretation tends to be rather culturalistic. This is because of culture, inherited traditions, this is because of religion, and that is very true. And without traditions and culture and religion, it would have been impossible. But there is a substrate of real brute violence. And I took the trouble in this first chapter to show the ways in which men 
uh, exerted extreme violence on women, uh, disfigure them and kill them. Uh, and forever the men who do that are go without punishment, it, it can do that with impunity. That is one very important thing of the terror regime of male supremacy. And the other thing is that although it's secret, the rumor spreads, women know what can happen to them. I want to be brief, it's a, a, a some, a, a, an enumeration of forms of traditional violence against women who do not keep their place, uh, but most of it would not be entirely new to you. Although the degree of it and the, 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 the mass of it is so, sometimes somewhat scary. But maybe what brought me to this is in the century, the past century of which I have lived in the meantime, a good part, almost every th function or position that I and the people around me, the men around me, were uh, sure that women could not achieve it and could not uh, be successful in it was conquered by women. Uh, almost anything you can think of, jet pilots, uh, CEOs of la very large companies, prime ministers, uh, fire brigades, construction workers, deep sea divers, you can think of it. And then if you come to think of that after a lifetime, you start to think if women can do all these things, if they have the opportunity, what tremendous oppression there must have been to keep all those millions of women in their place and prevent them from doing it. This must have been an enormous machinery. So maybe I came late to insights that many other people have had before me, but finally, the, uh, as one of my aunt, German aunts used to say, das Groschen war gefallen, the, the quarter also fell in my uh, slots. Now, if one looks at jihad, uh, there are a whole number of jihadist movements, but the most interesting was ISIS, Daesh, because for a brief while it succeeded in having something of a ter territory and an organized administrative and military structure. Uh, there, what you see in Elysian terms is a rare example of pure decivilization of a pure collapse of all civilized norms. And they are very explicit about it. The, 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 one of the most important texts uh, um, uh, about the, the jihad for the jihadist movement is called The Management of Savagery, and it encourages to create chaos all over to be as cruel and unpredictably uh, mean and dangerous and intimidating as you can, so that chaos will ensue. And in those chaos, people will be so uh, atomized and so scared and frightened that they will do the bidding of these small warrior groups. And within the community itself, we now have testimony, for example, by Father Jules de Bois, who went to Ukraine to, to document the Ukrainian uh, mass murder of the Jews in the Second World War. He immediately, when Daesh fell in Accra, went there with his assistants and inf interviewed the Jazidi. And it is unbelievable. It's just totally, and it is the, 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 the express destruction of women, women's bodies, in a way very, very sexualized at first sight, but so bloody, so cruel, and so perverse that it's hard to imagine that lust played much of a role here. And the feminist idea that it's all about power and domination uh, seems appropriate. So there we have a rare example of maybe pure decivilization. But, but, uh, let me make two remarks. Uh, one, I think, yes, these jihadists, Daesh and Al-Shabaab and, and Boko Haram, 
are movements that belong in the huge area of Islam. Maybe very outlying, maybe very foreign, maybe perverted, but it's still connected to Islam. There's no way around that. Some uh, religious Muslims like to deny it, but you can't. It's part of it. On the other hand, of course, and I already said it, this is not Islam as they claim in its purest form. It's a perverted uh, form of, of Islam. But other religions in their fundamentalist vein can also be very, very oppressive and aggressive against women. And I took as an example, oh, let me say, why do I mention that? I'm not in the game of Muslim beating. That's not my trade. Rather, I look at it as what happens in, in, in extreme Islamism as a form as extreme religious orthodoxy in general. And if you look, for example, at, uh, say, the Catholic Church in Latin America, where in some countries it is at its most reactionary and its most powerful, you find a systematic uh, attempt to make women remain in the family to prevent them from uh, having jobs and to accept whatever liberty and license men uh, want to uh, allow themselves. Uh, the system what, which I'm talking about because it has been studied by feminist authors is called Marianismo Machismo and it's a strange perverted idea in which women must follow the example of La Mater Dolorosa, the forever grieving Maria over the death of her son. They must avoid any kind of sensual pleasure. Uh, when they sleep with their husbands, the Spanish expression is lo hizo el servicio, I did what he needed. Huh? Uh, and they must permit their men to be Machos, but macho in this description are childish men who forever quarrel and fight and drink and gamble. Uh, I give a very exaggerated picture, of course. Uh, but the women must learn to, to bear that because their reward will be in the hereafter, and that makes women superior. So the third imbunde, the third in this triangle, is the... the, the uh, the priest who encourages the women to bear their destiny. And he said, but you are far above these childish men because you bear all this and you are spiritual. So this is pure, what is Freud used to call, moral masochism. You suffer for the sake of the glory of the suffering. I'm not even sure whether men are having a very good time in the meantime because women can also are very good at blaming them and being morally superior, men are forever uh, guilty. So it's another, a very different and, not, and also rather violent game because there is a lot of violence against women, physical violence. Uh, so it would be, it's a, 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 how would you say, a complementary study. It's, um, I do not do it uh, systematically. It is not, I have a beautiful uh, intermezzo about Orthodox Jews in Jerusalem who chase women without, without headscarves out of the bus because they should be sitting in the back of the bus. But since the large majority of these very Orthodox Jews in Jerusalem are Americans, sitting in the back of the bus means you're black or you're comparable to black people. Because So basically what they are, is the, slo the, the feminist slogan, woman is the nigger of the world, is being acted out in buses in Jerusalem. Why am I laughing? Well, I have hidden sympathies for Orthodox Jews, maybe, not in this quality. Uh, and it's not such a huge movement, it just happens in, in the streets of Jerusalem. But it is so telltale for what happens. But let me now come to... Let me now come... Yeah, huh? uh, worldly, I'm doing a very quick to tour, of course, of the book, to worldly, secular rightists. And that, again, is rather scary business. This now exists without place, in a way without time, 
in the virtual world of the Internet. And at the extreme right, you find unreformed Nazis, uh, people who are saying, uh, for example, oh, I have such a beautiful portrait of uh, Heinrich Himmler with his children, you should really see him, or who celebrate Hitler's birthday. I mean, they're completely unreformed. Uh, uh, and their great goal in life is to destroy all the Jews, which in a way in the extreme right movement is a bit old-fashioned. Uh, it is also... This is the, 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 how should I say, lunatic fringe uh, to see. And one must realize uh, part of these websites are organized. They have a moderator. They have even a political leader. They have a program. Uh, and they have secret, secluded chat boxes, chat rooms, where you need to have a password to get in. But they also have an open visitor space where tens of thousands of people visit. And it's very hard. I'm talking about Stromfonds or uh, Stroma. Uh, these are, are where they have to change all the time because sometimes they are thrown off the internet. Uh, and they are also completely uh, Vaterlandslose Geselle, which is very un Nazi, because. It is completely war global. So Dutch and Flemish Nazis are uh, on the American side, and so are Brazilian or maybe uh, uh, Serbian Nazis. And they talk the same talk. They have the same ideas. And then there are the visitors. And we don't know what they think. I'm one of those visitors. Uh, but the, 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 the quality of the violence and the perversion and the sickly jokes. So, for example, somebody makes a gift. He says, here's $5 for a strong fund. Well, uh, it's not six million, but at least it's something. And six million is forever a little jocular word. So there is a site which is called the Daily Shoah. Let it think in. It's a Shoah every day. I mean, that's ambitious. Uh, it is extremely perverse. Sometimes it's loony, sometimes it's scary. But these are more interesting in a way are the white supremacist sites, like American Renaissance. They're not necessarily uh, anti-Semitic because you have to grant it to the Zionists that they uh, know how to hit the, the, hit the Arabs. So there is a, there is a, a division in hate against Jews and hate against Arabs. And then you've got to hand it to Israel. They have a nuclear bomb. But all these sides, when you look at women, it's the, the nation that comes first. The nation is built out of families. And women should obey their men, support their men, be protected, are second place. And one woman, for example, proudly says, yes, sometimes I argue with my husband, but when he says, now it's enough, then I submit to him and I give him his, uh, his due. And you have to, sc uh, after a little while, this an extreme misogyny comes up, and then women on the side complain that ma they have now have uh, their own chat room because men have been talking so badly about them, are so mean about them. Uh, so part of this Nazi, neo-Nazi, white supremacist is anti-feminist. And by the way, you might not know it, but the feminists are the creature, the puppets of the cultural Marxists. And the cultural Marxists, basically Gramsci and the Frankfurters, uh, having an unheard success in, in, in extreme right-wing circles, uh, decided that since the class war was a failure, they're now going to wage a cultural war. And their ruse was to invent the feminist movement to undermine white virility, to make women uppity and destroy the family, then invite masses and hordes of foreigners so that the white 
family structure that creates the nation would be undermined and collapse. Uh, this, by the way, is more or less the worldview of Anders Breivik, who took the trouble to write a thousand page treatise on uh, his views before he went killing 77 people. Not at all an unintelligent treatise. He could have writ written a PhD on the cultural Marxist on the Frankfurter Schule, but now I'm afraid he copied it all from Fjordman, another rightist. Uh, but if he wrote it himself, it was not at all entirely stupid. Um, there is one more rightist or alt-right current, which is called the Manosphere. And there, young men complain that women don't give them any attention. They are incels, uh, involuntary celibates. And they're very angry. And it is not that they, they're basically they think that pretty women, what they call ten tens, ten out of a scale of ten on a scale, they love making ratings of themselves and others in terms of virility of femininity. And ten tens uh, ignore them. They only see the chats, the stallions, uh, the, the real attractive ten ten men. And... Uh, faggot cucks like them never get a chance. But then you look at it and they have the idea that women do not have the right, pretty women do not have the right to refuse a man. And it's, uh, they, uh, their uh, entitlement to any women is rejected. And that is a great, un uh, very, very unjust state of affairs. Some of these men desperately go out killing. Now, of course, they are in no way typical of these sites, except for one thing. The man who started uh, uh, mass shooting in Canada, Elliot, uh, Roger Elliot, uh, wrote a little treatise about being an involuntary celibate and women rejecting him, killed 11 people, and is being lionized, celebrated, made into a hero of these, and that is scary. Uh, the, because another gloss about these right-wing sites, except for the real Nazi sites, is that they are ironic. They have developed irony as the, the fundamental tone, so they never mean it entirely. It's not entirely serious. I mean, saying uh, those six million, you know, it's a little bit jocular so that they cannot be held responsible. But they are also anonymous. And they're also sitting somewhere in the world, uh, stood up after dinner. Don't you wash the dishes? No, I'm going up. I have to work. Sitting on, in the attic behind the little screen uh, and doing their little thing before they may have looked at porn sites. I hope they did. And now they have these other obscene sites. And it doesn't always mean very much. People just say things, four, or five, six words, very quickly. It disappears very quickly. It is utterly incoherent. Uh, but it's very hard to fathom. And therefore, that adds to the irresponsibility. All right. Let me round this out. What are we seeing? What is, what is going on? Obviously, women modern women, women who are, as they say, liberated or emancipated, by which basically what means that they have jobs for themselves, that they are financially independent from men, that they have an education, that they uh, have opinions in politics, uh, women who claim the same privileges as men have claimed for themselves, create an enormous amount of resentment. And certainly in the, 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 the growth of right-wing and extreme fundamentalist movements or group of schools, it is not difficult to see that, uh, that this is a counter-movement against women's emancipation. Uh, if we would look at it in, an, in a civilizing perspective, 
I think Daesh would be the clearest example of complete decivilization, com collapse in every sense. But interesting about these, uh, many of these right-wing sites is how much they go against the late 20th century mode of civilizing process. Uh, how, uh, if I would sum up the, 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 the late uh, stage of the civilizing process, I would say it's all about taking into account more aspects of more people at more moments in time. And this idea that you have to take into account other people means that you have to restrain many, many impulses of your own. But you do that in a sort of a negotiating process. It's a non-authoritarian process. And it requires great self-control to negotiate these positions. This is exactly the opposite of what the rightist movement want. They are basically authoritarian. They feel that there are entire groups that do not qualify as entirely human, who are not entitled to consideration, immigrants, black people, or Indians, as the right-wing sites say, uh, that there are hierarchical differences between people and unbridgeable gaps between men and women. Men are from Mars and women are from Venus. Uh, the greatest stupidity I have. <laughs> uh, and therefore, that there is a natural order of, of, uh, of authority. So I will leave it at this, and, and it would be very interested to hear your remarks, even if they happen to be critical. I'll have to cope with them. <laughs> What is striking is the number of extreme right-wing female leaders, Marine Le Pen, uh, Sarah Palin in Alternative für Deutschland. Frankly, I don't exactly know why that is. Somebody says that this to give the, uh, the movement a more friendly, less aggressive face, but that sounds too, too uh, intentional. Too, uh, so. In these right-wing sites, many women say that they feel comfortable, that they feel at home, at home, and they feel good. And they don't mind taking, playing second fiddle with their husbands, as long as they can be proud of their husbands and they are being respected. And one thing appears very important to me, and that is that these, many of these women think, not entirely without provocation, that the feminist movement and the urban uh, educated class looks down on motherhood and that their life, which was entirely and truly devoted to children and husbands, is worthless and that they're stupid cows for doing it. Well, if so on the one hand, there is a real satisfaction that also can come from a subordinate motherly role and feminists have explained how especially elder women are very much part of this authority structure and very much uh, support it. And there is the feeling that they are being despised by people who think they are cleverer than they are. Uh, women also play a part in some fighting groups and fight like the best of them, but there is some participant observation courage uh, to dare to be part of those militant groups who say that yes, the women fight and demonstrate and, 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 and uh, uh, jostle like the best of them, but once they are back uh, in, the, in, the, in the cafe or in the meeting, they must take second place. They must respect the prim primacy of the man. But I have this from books. Uh, I have almost everything from books in my life. <laughs> Well, 
the general human pattern, huh? uh, which I think is a nice way of generalizing. I take it up from an old Mar Dutch Marxist, is that man have the greater share of the means of persuasion, intimidation, and physical violence. And they do so, I'm quoting Joop Hausblom, who may be the great absentee today, because their slight physical superiority in force and speed allowed them to monopolize the weapons once they developed them. Then they were armed, and women were not, and then they turned religion in an instrument of female, uh, of male uh, supremacy. Huh? So almost always men have had the stronger end of it, but having said that, one must start a class analysis, of course, because there were also queens and princesses. But look, we have only 40 minutes, and this is a very sophisticated audience. Uh, of course, rich women, noble women could mistreat poor uh, men. Uh, but male supremacy by the means of violence and the means of persuasion is a very general pattern in history. When did women get a chance to, to, to fight that? To my mind, education is the key. And it all turns around education and women becoming literate and learning the skills to make, uh, to, to independently uh, earn a living. That seems to me the key developments. Uh, and of course, we live and we have been living for a long time in under the rule of law where you cannot just beat and mistreat and, and maim or kill women without punishments. But, but there are some exceptions. It's still not easy, even in under the rule of law, to even in Western democracies, to prosecute every case of domestic violence. But I wouldn't advise you, as a man, to kill a woman and think that you go without punishment. That is rare in Western democracies. I said, I wouldn't take the risk. <laughs> I think that it goes against the, the, the general uh, momentum of civilizing processes because it denies a health of humanity the right to choose its own partners. These people really feel that they're entitled to have a woman. Uh, this Roger Elliot, who went on a killing spree, said, he was, go no, this was an, another of these insults who went on the killing spree. He wanted to kill the members of the most prestigious sorority at the university because those were the, the girls who refused him. So they have this idea that you have uh, very, uh, the chads, the, 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 the uh, seducti artists of seduction, they are 10 out of 10. And then you have the beta males. And then you have me. <laughs> and so you are rated from 10 to 0. And if you are like 8, you are a beta cock faggot. Uh, but still, the beta cock faggots, some of them, these insults, feel that they are still entitled to have the members of the sorority, who in their view are 10 tens. Um, because it doesn't behoove a woman to decide who she's going to sleep with. It's a very strange sense, of, it's, by the way, it's absurd, but it's a sense of entitlement who, which comes straight from fantasy, from adolescent, this is very, usually very young man, adolescent fantasy, but it goes head on against every idea of uh, uh, respect for others, consideration for others, impulse control. Uh, these are, so to say, regressive developments. But it struck me, I was just before I, I, I gave this lecture, how difficult it for, is for us to have words that are non-judgmental. Progressive for us is neutral to positive. But reactionary is 
totally negative. Regressive is totally negative. Uh, authoritarian is basically negative. So all the words we have for All the words, all the words we have for to characterize more conservative right-wing movements are already negative. They got a point there, those guys. <laughs> Male physical strength has become much, much less important through industrialization and mechanization. And by the way. Uh, um, exclusively male working settings are disappearing. And it's very clear that many men, uh, if for example, the United States, were in, resent the idea that a man can no longer proudly earn his work with his own hands in a low schooled but highly skilled work like miner, fisherman, sailor, uh, fireman, those really, really masculine jobs so that this kind of uh, lower, cla lower class male pride is eroded. Uh, so your point is very well taken, uh, certainly. And then women get educated, get highfalutin and apathy. <laughs> yeah. Alice Neagle did a study of those right-wing sites, and she found something which I consider very important. She said, that uh, transgression, being outrageous, being provocative, is an essential element of these sites. Her book is called Kill All Normies. But normies for the Dutch among us is, of course, Klootjes folk, which comes straight from Provo. And uh, she thinks that this celebration of transgression for transgression's sake, which was so much a part of the left-wing artistic avant-garde of the 60s and 70s, has been taken over tooth and nail by these right-wing sides, who sometimes are even funny. Uh, I mean, politically correct was a trouvaille of genius. Uh, and uh, so, Uh, there is an excitement. They're all being funny. You, uh, uh, the, the dialogue is very quickly. It took to totally nonsensical. It makes no sense whatsoever, but it's very quick. Uh, and looks like spirited. It's also dirty, transgressive, offensive. And probably most of the people who engage in it, who are not really card-carrying Nazis or white supremacists or Ku Klux Klan people, don't take it too serious themselves and might be a little bit embarrassed if it was as if they were on a porn site, which is very exciting, if not boring. We have to say that it's boring, but you and I know that sometimes it's exciting. <laughs> uh, there are, of course, there are matriarchs. For example, in, 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 in very ethnic uh, tribe, ethnic societies, the, the, the superior women of the clan, once they have brought up their sons, are very, have very much respect and are the mainstays of the most repressive uh, traditions. They are often the ones who insist on honor killings. Huh? Yes. But still this is a male power balance in which we make some of the natives into local rulers. Uh, I'm making a colonial uh, metaphor in which, haven't we a black king which we ha highly respect and pay and, yes we do, <laughs> and we have female matriarchs uh, and of course this very quick panorama which I painted needs at every turn of the brush corrections and it is very, very complicated. But sometimes it's good to start at point zero and say there is a general human pattern and it's patriarchy. The last question. Good night, good night all. I'm Aline from Brazil. Hello. And um, I'm asking you how many women 
you have in your research group and what you think about a man talking about women of emancipation. I have only one woman in my research group. I have only one woman in my research, research group. She's my wife and she contradicts me. <laughs> but actually, I w all I did was read books, read essays, go on the internet. I did not myself interview women or study women. I read books of, by people who had done that. So mine is a tertiary form of research. That was one question. And then I heard, what the hell are you doing as a man? Uh, oh, that was it. Because I, I always prepare for that question. Uh -huh. uh, sorry? I, I didn't get that. It's almost the same, but uh, a little bit polite. Uh, what do you think a man talking about woman emancipation? Yeah, yeah. Uh, my wife says, why not? <laughs> uh, yes, why not? The question very rarely is raised when a white man talks, for example, about the black power movement, or when a uh, middle class academic talks about trade unionism. Uh, look, uh, isn't it time that men should that take it very seriously? And if m scholars are committed to equality, shouldn't they work with every mov movement which has as its objective a greater equality between people? Sorry? Showing the two are interdependent. Yes, of course. Yes. But I'm always preparing for the opposition. What are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.